more general environment can affect gene expression and we're interested in how chromatin domains can form and how they're regulated and how they can influence gene expression and then um, at, at an even more global level how the genome is organized in the nucleus and there's ample evidence from a lot of systems that where a gene is positioned can influence its gene expression and this can be um, regulated. Um, I don't have to convince you that the worm is a good model system, but just to point out for, <coughs> for looking at chromatin regulation, a really great thing is we have a very small, very well annotated genome in the worm, and it's 30 times smaller than the human or mouse genomes, and that makes high throughput studies a lot faster and a lot cheaper. Um, the there's a complement of chromatin proteins really similar <coughs> to human, and that means that the, the things that we learn are applicable. We have a lot of chromatin mutants, a lot of temperature sensitive mutants, which are very useful. RNAi, we can access um, to turn off genes at will. And now obviously with CRISPR, that's, um, everyone is embracing that. But also it's a natural system, it's a multicellular organism, and so we can address these systems and look at effects in development and not, as opposed to a cell culture system, which are useful too, but we really want to know um, how these processes work normally. So to start, um, so we're studying transcription, and I just want to start by telling you something we did a couple of years ago, and is a kind of dirty secret that people, a lot of people don't appreciate. If you're studying transcription, obviously you need to know where promoters are, where transcription starts. And until a few years ago, we didn't know where transcription started for almost any genes because of transplicing. So the majority of genes are transpliced in, in C. elegans, and the annotated, start of trans start TSS that's in worm base still mostly is not the transcription start site but it's the transcript start site the start of the mature transcript after transplicing so what happens is if this is the true TSS, let's say this is a gene of two exons and here's the primary transcript that's the five prime end at the end of that little black bit what happens is in trans, SL1, this transplice leader, usually SL1 is transpliced on, um, so you get tr cis and transplicing. Here's our mature transcript, so that's the start that's in worm base, and this little bit's degraded, and you never see it, and so we don't know where transcription started. And so you can't really study transcription without knowing where the promoters are, and the, um, Karen Edelman's lab had developed this technique of um, where you could map transcription initiation in the nucleus, she was using this to map pausing, <clears throat> and I realized that the, we realized that we could apply this and then find the initiation site. So essentially, what you can do is isolate RNA from the nucleus um, that's short, a less the short nascent transcript, 100 nucleotides or shorter, and they're capped because that's a hallmark of RNA polymerase too, and sequence those and capture those five prime ends before they're transpliced off, before you have this mature transcript. And we also made libraries of um, nuclear RNA to map transcription elongation. So we took the same preparation and, and made libraries that are longer, greater than 200, so we could monitor where elongation was in the nucleus. And this worked really well. So if you can see here, here's some examples. Here's a non-transplice gene. And you can see that this, we now just map the first base of those short transcripts on the uh, little browser. So here we can see piling up. There's a start that's just where the worm base start is. And here's one of the most, like most genes that's transpliced. Here's our start that's upstream of the annotated start. And in the long RNA, we could even see reads here over this thing that's called the outron because it's like an intron that's spliced out off. So we could identify the, the start sites. And we learned some really interesting things when we did this. And first, um, unlike what you learn in the textbook, transcription doesn't initiate just at a single place in most places in the genome. Most promoters are a broad cluster of initiation elements. So these are all windows of 100 base pairs uh, long, and these are clusters of initiation events. So 70% of the initiations genome-wide look like this, little clusters where you have very abundant ones and less abundant ones. Only 6% of the initiation sites across the genome are essentially a single base. 
and these are actually ones tend to be have Tata boxes. So Tata boxes also are very rare, only about five or six percent have them, and they tend to have more sharp initiation sites. Um, we were able to um, cluster, when we um, looked genome-wide, instead of, we couldn't, we, we clustered initiation regions and called them TSS clusters, or, and so we have 75,000 basically initiation sites genome-wide, and we could assign about a third of them to protein coding genes, and about two-thirds didn't look like they mapped near protein coding genes, and I'm going to come back to that um, in a minute. If we look, um, the other thing that was very clear if we look genome-wide is that we could see that most sites, if we, this is the plus strand, we had strand-specific libraries, these are plus strand initiations and those are minus strands, they generally were paired. So we'd have a plus and a minus separated by about 120 base pairs. So we have bi-directional transcription initiation in most regions of the genome and we could see many initiation sites everywhere. And that happened both at the ones that we could identify as protein coding and as these other um, initiation sites. So if we looked at the initiation sites, the ones that looked that we could assign as promoters um, have um, chromatin features of promoters as generally having high H3K4 trimethylation, which is a home often found at active promoters and lower H3K4 monomethylation. The ones that we, that didn't, that we didn't know, um, couldn't assign as protein coding promoters, more often had chromatin features of enhancers, which had higher um, H3K4 monomethyl than H3K4 trimethyl. And this suggests that maybe these were actually enhancers <coughs> rather than promoters. And so we decided to, as a way to, to address this, we asked if these unassigned initiation events mapped to transcription factor binding sites at the Modern Code Consortium had mapped genome-wide a lot of transcription factor binding events. And when we looked at that, we found that um, th these regions indeed, these initiation sites indeed, essentially almost always mapped to um, tr um, these transcription factor binding regions. And we could, um, and these had bidirectional transcription initiation. So we have an active enhancer signature, which is transcription factor binding and transcription initiation. Um, and a similar definition is, um, has been um, defined in, uh, for humans. I, one thing I want to kind of point out is that most transcription factor binding regions across the genome initiate transcription. We can detect initiation. And also the majority of initiation in the genome actually occurs. The opposite is true at transcription factor binding sites. And if you put these together, it, you can conclude that transcription at these enhancer region actually accounts for a large fraction of non-coding transcription. So when you see non-coding transcription, people talk about this and detect it, most of this in the worm genome, and I think probably in all genomes, is, is actually from initiations <laughs> that are at enhancer elements. Just to sh now to show you a little bit about what these initiations look like, we have different kind of patterns. This is the simplest pattern. Here's a divergently transcribed gene. That gene goes this way, this gene goes that way. And here's a forward, the red and the blue are these two initiation sites. So this, these are the two promoters for these two genes. And they're kind of sharing a little um, nucleosome depleted region in the middle. Then we can have this one, it's a bit more complex, where this is, I think, the core promoter and made probably some enhancer elements upstream. But we can have very complicated regions like this as well, where we have 100 initiation sites in a 30 kilobase region. And if you look at all of these across the genome, you can see that these are probably doing different things. It's hard to imagine that all of these initiation sites are just promoters and enhancers, and probably, you know, these um, they prob these all actually ha correspond with transcription factor. There's a lot of transcription factor binding regions here, but I think they're probably not acting. It's unlikely that they're all acting as individual enhancers, and maybe the, this um, regions like this could be. Um, active maybe to generate some uh, open chromatin that has some other property rather than specifically enhancing transcription in certain tissues. But it's something to, that we're interested in trying to understand what's the, the function of these very active regions. So by, from all of that work we could say that enhancers and promoters have similar properties. 
they bind transcription factors, they recruit RNA polymerase II, they initiate bidirectional transcription, and we can also see they can drive productive elongation. So what's the difference really between enhancers and promoters, and what's the function of transcription at enhancers? And we actually don't have the answers to those questions, and things that people, we and others, are thinking about. If you have, for example, transcription initiating an enhancer and maybe having a productive elongation, <coughs> it could help to deliver Paul 2 to a promoter if it's not that far away. Um, perhaps if there was a loop, then um, you could have a reinitiation here and that could help deliver. In transcription through a region could alter chromatin accessibility and I think a lot of regulation of gene expression has to do with altering a chromatin accessibility to allow factors to bind but this could remove nucleosomes for example the process and also possibly enhancers could act as alternative promoters. Maybe elements can act as enhancers in some contexts and promoters in some contexts and given that they look very similar I think that's quite possible. And we've decided to kind of explore the potential of enhancers to at least have that activity. So. Um, to try and understand what these elements might could be doing, we decided to take these little individual elements that were defined by transcription factor binding initiation sites and act ask if they could promote transcription in a transgenic context. So we have histone GFP here, no minimal promoter, and we'll just clone individual elements in front of this and ask if they can drive histone GFP. And um, so here's a, an example. So this is a, a gene here, and this is a promoter um, and some predicted enhancers upstream. Um, if we take this whole region, then we got this expression pattern in the embryo. You can see it's not in every tissue here. It's missing. This is the gut um, that it's missing from here. Um, what we found in doing a number of these is first a kind of a surprising thing is that the, the proximal promoter and this that's very near the gene often drives the full expression pattern from this whole region. Um, and it's, we don't know if it's as robust but overall the, 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 the spatial and temporal patterns look very similar. Um, the second thing we could find is about half of the enhancers that we test can function as protein coding promoters if you just put them directly in front of histone GFP. And when they function, they're always driving a subset of the full pattern of the gene. So this is a very typical example. We can see that, that these cells at the tip of the tail here this, in this embryo are the same ones that are, that are here. Um, and they're generally weaker expression and a subset of the pattern. So that was <coughs> very interesting and we now want to try and, we, what we haven't done is to, re, for example, in this gene, remove these and see if they're actually necessary in this context. Um, one can wonder what are these for, are they actually doing anything, obviously they're here, I think they must be doing something to help either to make the, the pattern more robust in this work um, from Mike Levine's lab looking at shadow enhancers, showing that some enhancers seem to function under stressful conditions to kind of prevent, to make sure a gene is expressed properly. Um, here's an, uh, those were all upstream enhancers. We've done some intronic enhancers as well, which um, in, a, in a normal context, for example, here, it's possible that these enhancers could actually function as tissue-specific promoters in, in a normal situation. They're in a, a position, that given that if you, once you had transplicing, you don't know where the, if the transcript had initiated. This one can't, it's in an intron, and this one also drives a very nice pattern, and this is the actual, the known expression pattern for this gene, BRO1. The other thing that we've tested is, given that these elements have bidirectional initiation, we asked what happens if we invert them? Do, will they work in both orientations? And here's an example of, from an enhancer. And it, the cases we've tested so far have all worked in both orientations, but they've driven slightly different expression patterns in the two orientations. So this is just a kind of color coded for a, a number of tissues here. And you, we could see that it was in a, a, some, some tissues in this orientation and a subset of those tissues and weaker in the other orientation. And um, 
but we never um, we never have a completely different patterns in both orientations and we're um, now expanding this so we can test hundreds of elements to try and learn some more principles where we have more examples this is very low throughput as opposed to some you may have seen papers where people doing high throughput assays of enhancer and promoter function which are fantastic but those are having to go in one cell type rather than the thousands of cell types that are in an animal. So we can't um, get that throughput in this assay, but basically that enhancer or promoter will go through every single cell type that it, of the animal. And we can ask, it will definitely be in the one that it would normally be active. And the, the, um, the enhancers that are inactive and also the ones that are active, we're asking, compare their activity as a promoter versus an enhancer. And we have a new minimal promoter construct um, to do that. And then we use genome editing to test things that we uh, learn, to, to test hypotheses in vivo. Okay, so um, just um, alongside this work, in order to understand all the regulatory principles, we need to know where all the regulatory elements are in the genome. And so we've, um, we're nearing completion of a project to, tr to do genome-wide identification of regulatory elements across development. And this involves um, um, taking advantage of the accessibility of regulatory elements to nucleases. So um, when transcription factors um, bind or also at promoters, they're generally nucleosome depleted. For example, here, um, enhancers and promoters both are usually nucleosome depleted and then they're accessible to digestion by from DNA one or micrococcal nuclease and more recently you probably have heard of a taxic where it uses TN5 transposition and if you apply these to um, nuclei that still have uh, nucleosomes these little fr you can either isolate the little fragments you, of DNA generally that are released or the nucleosomes and then sequence them and then you can see a little peak for example this is an example where these fragments are isolated and then you can see you have a hypersensitive site and that will show you where the regulatory elements are so we've um, uh, done across the six developmental stages um, uh, in the worm a tax seek to find, um, this, this is a very se more sensitive method than DNA one hypersensitivity mapping, but we've also done DNA one mapping. I'll show you a little bit of data from that at different concentrations because that uncovers different information. We're mapping transcription initiation at the different stages so we can map promoters, looking at nuclear RNA profiling so we can look at where transcription is elongating in the nucleus and mapping a set of histone modifications. And so mo we have most of these data now. Um, so here's an example of the attack seek um, at the different developmental stages. You can see we see development. We have 31,000 elements that we've identified across the genome. Here's some embryonic um, uh, peaks that are in embryos and essentially not in the other stages. Here's a, a, a peak that's in a, probably a, an active promoter that's in all stages. Um, and we see about 5,000 of those 31,000 are only in one stage, but um, about two-thirds of them show develop, of these peaks show developmental regulation. And I just want to point uh, out this nice, um, this DNAs one if you apply this at different concentrations, at low DNAs, this is a classic DNAs hypersensitivity mapping, you see a peak of um, where uh, the, the, it's cutting, where you can isolate those little fragments. It's very similar to a tax seek, but if you have a little bit higher DNA concentration, this middle bit is digested away and you start seeing the plus one and the minus one nucleosomes that flank this hypersensitive site. And the red are promoters and the blue are enhancers. So we can see that the promoters um, have this characteristic, very um, labile nucleosomes that flank the hypersensitive site where enhancers don't. And then if you have high concentration of DNA, it digests completely away the hypersensitive site and these um, flanking nucleosomes. So we can see promoters have a much more depleted, they're much more accessible than the enhancers. So we use this also to annotate these elements. 
Okay, so um, the second thing, the thing I want to spend the most time on is looking at chromatin domains and how, uh, zooming out a little bit from enhancers and promoters and to see, think about how if there's a, an organization to the genome uh, of a domain organization, what kinds of genes are there, what, how might active or inactive regions of the genome be formed and be regulated. So we know that um, chromatin activity, you, um, we know that histone um, tails can be modified and that these modifications can are associated with different with different levels of gene activity even if we don't know what the functions of a lot of, of modifications are and that you can describe activity by patterns of marks for example H3K36 trimethylation often marks the uh, transcribed re, uh, genes the bodies of transcribed genes eight the, the um, methylation trimethylation of lysine 4 marks often marks active promoters, and H3K27 trimethylation often marks, marks inactive chromatin, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this a bit more. This is uh, put on by this um, classical complex, the polycomb PRC2 complex. Um, and we've done a lot of mapping of through modern code and also outside of modern code of a lot of different histone modifications and factors to try and understand because knowing where a factor is bound and the patterns can uh, tell you what that factor might be doing. So I think it's important to have a description of this before you start under trying to understand what, um, what might be happening in the mutant. So we do a lot of um, this mapping to try and uncover patterns. So um, to try and uh, apply what's um, this uh, to um, in a developmental context and looking at um, and how chromatin might be regulated, we decided to compare the chromatin uh, at two different developmental stages. So um, Susan Strom's lab had, through Modern Code, had been mapping chromatin of early embryos, which are, um, the sample was undifferentiated dividing cells, very early embryos and we map the chromatin of L3 larvae, which are about 85% of the, the larvae were differentiated cells and about 15% are mitotic germ cells. And in parallel, we use the same antibodies and we map the same histones or histone modifications here. Um, to, uh, so we decided to then use these to, to see if we can look for um, similarities and differences. To try and summarize the data, we decided to do chromatin state mapping, which is a technique pioneered by Bas von Steensel's lab, and it's a way to summarize data. If you have a lot of different um, patterns, so each of these tracks would be an individual factor, and you can see when you see black where you have signal, and you can see some of them have shared patterns and some look different. So if you look across and you can have make a hidden Markov model that takes windows and keeps looking across here, see the windows, it doesn't have a particular window size, it finds it. Um, then you can summarize and say, I look, it will find reproducible patterns across the genome, and in this case, say this pattern, it assigned to a certain number, but here they've now called it black, for example, so they, call, they, just, they assign colors. So across the genome, whenever you have black, it, it will be a certain similar combination of factors, or yellow or red. And this is very useful because then when you go back, you can find certain colors would then, uh, or combinations would associate with different features in the genome. So we applied this using our 17 histones or modifications, and here's the chromatin state map for L3 autosomes. We have 20 states, and after we could annotate where these are uh, on the genome, we can look and see that the state one is where the promoters were located. We can see transcription elongation states, because these were on the bodies of genes associated with introns or exons, enhancers, certain states, state eight, nine, and 10. And then these states at the bot that we've put at the bottom were the states that are more associated with gene inactivity, the polycomb associated marks um, that are enriched for H3K27 trimethyl here you can see, or H3K9, which is also a mark of gene inactivity. So we've ordered them to put um, at the top five the states that are the most highly associated with 
the genes with active genes. So genes that are in the top 20% of expression um, are most associated, these states are most associated with those, and these 16 to 20 are most associated with genes in the bottom 20% of expression. And then um, here we have all the other states. Because we wanted to see if there were g um, gene activity domains in, in the genome and look for patterns. And what we found here, um, now we have the active five states. Here, here's here's the, the genes across the genome. Here are the active five states. And it's very striking that the active states all form clusters across many genes. Here you can see these large clusters. And the inactive ones also. Here the, it's the, the bottom five, the inactive five. And then the other ten were kind of interspersed. And across the genome we found these extended regions of either active genes or inactive genes, and these were larger um, than you would expect by chance, these groups of, of, of states. So we decided to subdivide, um, to call domains based on these. So here are the domains where orange um, I'll be calling as active domains, or these are from the highly active states, and the black are, uh, correspond are called based on the inactive genes here. And then we have the gray zones are the border regions between the active and the inactive um, domains. I want to point out the domains I'm going to call active and inactive, but they're not purely active or inactive. <coughs> they're not uniform in activity. They're just called based on these states which are associated with a particular kind of activity. And so 11% of genes that are in the bottom 40% of expression, very lowly expressed, are actually inactive domains. And also 20% of genes in the top 20% of expression are in the inactive domain. So we have active genes here for sure, and we definitely have inactive genes, lowly active genes here. These are just called based on the states. Now we repeated this in the early embryos, and it was very, we, very strikingly, so first we saw the same sort of pattern, but strikingly the patterns were almost identical between the early embryos and the L3 larvae. I'll show you that um, here a bit, to put, getting rid of the states and lining up another region. We found that 85% of the border positions are in common between early embryos and L3 larvae, and 90% of the base pairs, if you just look at the base pairs in the active and the inactive uh, regions, were in common despite the fact that they don't have cell types in common. Early embryos versus IL-3 larvae are a completely different, almost completely different cell type. So we, this, we can sh conclude that these chromatin domains are relatively stable across development and cell types. Now we looked at, um, at what modifications might be associated with these. It's, it's very striking that um, there's a very close correspondence of active domains with H3K36 trimethylation and of inactive domains here with a, um, H3K27 trimethylation. And the, um, even though there are some differences, the, the, these patterns look very similar in early embryos and L3 larvae. So to, um, then we decided to investigate the properties of domains um, and see what, um, if we can learn something about um, what's inside them and how they might be formed. And all, all these plots will have on the left the inactive domains, then this middle, I don't, hope you can see very faint lines, these two <laughs> here, that's the border domain that's between in, in, inactive and active, and then on the right are active domains all lined up in an aggregate plot across the genome. So not surprisingly, RNA polymerase 2 is, high, is much higher in the active domain than the inactive domain. We see histone H3 is depleted at the transitions from active to border and border to inactive. Um, very strikingly, we see an enrichment for transcription factor binding sites and enhancer chromatin states in the border regions. And I'm going to come back to that um, in a few minutes. So what about the types of genes that are in these um, domains? Um, we found, again, not surprising, the ubiquitously expressed genes are mostly in active regions. Genes that we classified as silent because they were basically in, not detectably expressed at any stage, those are in inactive domains. But quite strikingly, genes <coughs> that we could um, annotate as germline expression um, were in active domains, and not only that, that most genes in active domains we could um, annotate as 
germline expressed. And at least um, in the best annotation that we could find for <coughs> using maternal gene expression, 85% of genes in that set are in, uh, of, of active domain genes um, are, have maternal expression. And it's likely to be higher because this, the, the annotation is likely to be not complete. So it may be that every gene in active domains are, are expressed in the germline. Um, okay, so we, we're getting some idea about what these are. We wanted to um, look a little bit more about what types of genes might, different types of genes might be here. And to do that, we turn to this uh, type of analysis using the coefficient of variation of gene expression. I want to explain what that is. Um, Essentially, it's a measure of how a gene expression varies across development and cell types. So if you have a gene that's expressed in every cell type at every stage, the variation in le gene expression level won't change very much. And that will be like this. This is RNA-seq at, say, all the different developmental stages. This gene is expressed at a very similar level at every stage. So this is very low variation. The CV is, a, is the standard deviation in the gene expression level over the mean expression. Expression. And this will have very low um, variation. And here we have a gene that's developmentally regulated. So by definition, a gene that has a high CV value, we can annotate as regulated because you can only have a high CV if it has high expression in some cells or tissues and low expression in others. So this is a good example. N very low expression in embryos and L1 and L2 larvae, it's high and then it goes down again. So we annotated, we took genes which we could first say were significantly expressed in at least a stage, so we're only looking at genes that we know we can detect expression, and we took the bottom third of CV values and called, annotated them as broadly or stably expressed. And then the top third of CV values, um, genes like this, and we could call them then developmentally regulated genes. And we asked where are these two types of genes? And very strikingly, the um, active domains, um, almost so the, uh, the broadly stably expressed genes were predominantly found in the active domains, but this very striking thing is the developmentally regulated genes are almost all in the inactive domains. Just, and these genes are all detectably expressed in, in the RNA-seq data. So we can say these two types of domains, active domains have broadly expressed genes. They're generally almost always expressed in the germline, and these are marked by H3K36 trimethylation. Inactive domains, on the other hand, contain developmentally regulated genes, genes I say silent, but obviously are going to be expressed at some time that we have probably haven't worked out what the stage is, so these by probably we could define them as regulated at, in some level, could be not, maybe not developmentally, maybe environmentally regulated, but, and these genes in inactive domains are marked by A3K27 trimethyl. Now one very striking <coughs> and very interesting thing is that um, a paper last year from the Guigo lab found that developmentally regulated genes fail to be marked by H3K36 when they're expressed by looking, and as looking mainly in Drosophila. Um, and so, again, that, that's very similar to what we're finding here, is that genes, these genes here, despite this, this H3K36 being a mark of, of, say, transcription elongation, it doesn't seem to be always found on trans during transcription elongation. If a gene is regulated um, on it, and either, for example, temporally regulated, it doesn't seem to acquire H3K36 in Drosophila in this pattern, in this paper, and essentially we don't see that either here. Okay, so this association of germline gene expression and um, um, an H3K36 trimethylation led us to look at the relationship between these domains and, and MES4, which is a germline specific H3K36 tr methyl transferase that shows genetic interact that shows interactions with the polycomb system, which is where the in our inactive domains are, H3K27 trimethylation. So to just give you some background, there are two H3K36 histone methyl transferases in the worm. 
MET1, which is a SET2 family transcription coupled enzyme that puts, um, co-transcriptionally puts down K36, travels with RNA polymerase, associates with the C-terminal domain of RNA polymerase. And MES4, which is a different type, an NSD family methyl transferase, its transcription in activity is transcription independent and it's germline specific. And Susan Strom's lab has shown this marks genes that are transcribed in the germline um, with K30, if they have K36, it continues to put on K36. That mark is inherited by the embryo and MES4 is also provided maternally to the embryo and MES4 carries on putting this mark transcription independently until it, it, it runs out in the middle of embryogenesis. So it epigenetically transmits the memory of germline A3K36 marking to the progeny. So what she found is that here we have a germline expressed gene that has H3K36 trimethyl. Here's a, in the germline an inactive somatic gene marked by H3K27 trimethyl. And in a MES4 uh, loss of function, the germline genes acquired H3K27, they found trimethylation. So MES4 seems to inhibit PRC2. And this is um, not surprising, it's known that the H3K36 mark is inhibitory to PRC2 um, biochemically. So we decided to ask if the activities of MES, does the activity of MES4 have a role in domain definition using data that they generated? So um, they, they did um, mapping of H3K36 and H3K27 trimethylation in wild type and MES4 mutants. So here's the wild type data, here's our domains, and you can see here's the K36 trimethyl and the H3K27 trimethyl in wild type. And in the MES4 mutant, if we look at where our domains are, you can see the H3K27 encroaches into the active domains here. You can see another example here. And the active, the K36 domains get a bit smaller. There's, we still see them. This is a, um, an RNAi, so this is not a complete loss of function. But um, these domains shrink and the, um, the uh, K27 domains get larger. If we look genome-wide in a heat map, if we I point you to the K36, um, these are um, all the, the act, again, act, inactive regions, border active regions. You can see in the, here there's a lot of K36 that goes from the active region into the border, and now we lose all of that here, um, and the active region gets smaller here in MES4 RNAi, and we see the K27 um, spilling out into the active regions. And so based on this, we can say that the germline chromatin organization, since MES4 is a germline specific enzyme, is helping to define the domains and is, in, 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 is in, important in helping to organize these chromatin domains. Um, just a little aside, because it, I think it's just really interesting, we don't know um, how, what, what the uh, basis of this regulation is, is we see um, some very striking remodeling of chromatin at borders regions. So this is the inactive region, border active, and this H3K27 monomethylation, so the single methyl group, um, we find is very, has a very strong peak right in the border region, and it's, in, it's low both in the inactive and the active regions. So very specific to borders, and this has changed dramatically in L3 larvae. Um, now we don't see the peak right at the border, but we gain a lot of H3K27 monomethylation methyl now in the active region and as I say we don't know I, um, what the what the function of this is but it's a very striking remodeling that we're um, going to look into at the same time the levels of k36 trimethylation in the border regions I don't have a slide to show you this drop actually from early embryo to l3 Okay, so I just want to come back to now um, looking at the intergenic regions that I um, told you have um, at the border regions, sorry, um, the transcription factor binding sites and enhancer chromatin states are enriched in the border regions relative to the inactive or the active regions. And so we wanted to explore um, what might be different uh, about border regions compared to these others. And since uh, transcription factor binding sites and enhancers are transcription 
transcription regulatory elements generally, and these often are found in intergenic regions, we decided to compare intergenic region length to see if they look different in border regions compared to inactive or active regions. And indeed, we found that border, the intergenic regions in border regions, in borders, are significantly longer than those in the inactive domains or in the active domain. So this is a killer basis here. And um, there's also striking that the active regions have actually quite short intergenic regions compared to those in the inactive regions. If we look at intergenic region length in um, um, in uh, borders, we also find that they have the highest density of um, enhancer re enhancers based on transcription factor binding sites than compared to inactive or active regions. And this suggests this position of borders between active domains and inactive domains and this, uh, um, and this association with transcriptional regulatory elements suggests that transcriptional activity might contribute to the domain separation. This is something we're um, trying to test now. So to put all this together in, uh, in a model, if we have all of these gray boxes are um, genes, for example, in the genome. Um, we can see that MES4 in the germline it can put down H3K36 trimethylation mark on germline expressed genes, and these are also genes that tend to be broadly expressed. Um, this mark will then be inhibitory to the PRC2 complex, which then can mark other genes that are not marked by K36 trimethylation in the germline um, with, with uh, this um, H3K27 trimethyl. And these are, would be the developmentally regulated or regulated in other, in other contexts and lowly active genes. Um, and we now are want, uh, wanting to do, um, like uh, we have this data from Susan Strom's lab in MES4 mutants, we now want to do mapping in a PRC2 minus uh, mutant to try and um, test this model. Um, in addition, we found that besides this interaction between a MES4 and the PRC2, that these transcription fact that we have longer intergenic regions between act the, in the inactive domains and the active domains, and a higher density of transcription factor binding sites, and this may also contribute to the, the separation of domains. So um, how does this relate to other organisms? Well, you probably are familiar with hearing that, about polychrome system and how it's marking Hox genes and other developmentally regulated genes in Drosophila and helping to maintain um, um, gene expression uh, repression, a memory of repression. Um, but PRC2 can also put down the H3K27 uh, monomethylation and dimethylation mark, and these have been less studied. And if you look at K30, K27 trimethyl in Drosophila, it doesn't form these big blocks that we uh, have observed in Susan Strom's lab and Gatos et al. had pointed out here, these blocks of, of K27 across the genome that we see in the worm. But very excitingly, and interestingly, in the mouse in Drosophila, very recently, people have shown that there are extended blocks of H3K27 dimethyl that look very similar to the trimethyl that we see in the worm genome that are anti-correlated with H3K36 trimethyl here, you can see in the mouse. And in Drosophila, they mapped H3K27 dimethyl above the line or large blocks. And this is anti-correlated with um, Pol2, where they were looking at Pol2, um, um, where you have low K27 dimethylation, you, you generally see Pol2. They haven't done it K36 in this example. So it may be that this separation into um, domains of H3K36 um, methyl methylated regions and H3K27 methylated regions might be, a, a, be similar in other animals. Okay, so the last few minutes I want to um, tell you about how we, we'd now like to understand how these chromatin domains that we define based on marks relate to 3D organization and to see, um, to try and get some handle on how the genome is organized and also to, to try and understand how maybe enhancers and promoters can interact with each other. 
Um, we've decided, as others have done, to turn to these C methods um, that Job Decker has kind of pioneered, um, and where you can, these are chromatin interaction methods. Um, if you apply f fix nuclei um, uh, and then um, digest the nucle these nuclei, um, and then um, if a region of the genome that are very far apart, say in linear space, are close together and like and um, fixed together, you can then ligate them after you cut them and re-ligate -ligate them. And then you can say it's a way to tell what regions of the genome are in close proximity in the nucleus by ha having them ligate together. And um, I don't have time to go through how all these methods work, but the, the, if you apply these methods on a, on a smaller scale, you can get very high resolution interaction and say this region of the genome, the promoter interacts here with this region where there's a peak, and so this is a, say, enhancer promoter interaction. Uh, and if you apply it genome-wide, people have found these topologically associating domains, um, and so you can have domains within which interactions occur but you can't really see any specific interactions here because the, 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 the drawback of these methods is that the resolution is very low. So if you want to look genome-wide, which we do to, to compare our chromatin domains and the 3D structure, is um, these maps are generally, you have to bin all the interactions in a, in a window of either 10 kilobases to 100 kilobases because the data are very sparse. And the average gene in the worm is five kilobases. So we can't really get a very much, <laughs> we can't really get very far if we have to bin, have a 10 KB bin and we already have our genes, uh, that's already two genes there. And the domains I'm telling you about, I've told you about are generally around 15 kilobases. So this is not gonna work for us. So we've been working to develop a, a more streamlined, high resolution, high C method using DNA instead of restriction enzymes so that we can cut in a more precise um, location. And I don't have time to tell you exactly how this works, but I want to show you some results. And I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time to here to show um, validation. So in, um, Barbara Meyer's lab has generated one, there's one high c map for C. elegans, um, and she was used, she applied this to study dosage compensation, because the, the um, dosage compensation complex down regulates gene expression on the C. elegans X chromosome, and that leads to a change she showed in, in the structure of um, the X chromosome. And when they applied this method, they could find these little domains across the X chromosome, these boundaries between these little domains. And the, um, these, um, these dosage compensation proteins were tended to be enriched at these border, these boundaries between these domains. So that, that's these green things here. They also found there was a statistically significant enrichment for interactions between these sites, which are called the rec sites, or the, where these complexes bound. So they have this little peak, so that these sites tended to interact with each other. Um, so we used to compare our data to their data. Our data is this yellow and black at the bottom, and we could see the same boxes that they could see here, and we could call the same, um, essentially the same boundary position, so that we were very happy about that. Um, and um, then in comparing, looking at these interactions between <coughs> domains, this is when we wanted to look at our resolution, um, we're now able, we take our data and we can, instead of binning at 10 kilobases, we can look at 500 base pair bins and we can look at the data. And here's a little 200 kilobases of the chromosome X, and this is the data from the Meyer lab. Each of these little loops in black is an interaction that they reported in their data and in red are their rec sites that are statistically significantly enriched for interactions. So you can see it in the data overall, but you can't actually visually see these interact, these in, this enrichment for interactions. But in our DNA high C, we now can actually see these interactions. So the resolution is much um, and better, and our signal noise is, is very good. So you can see very what nicely these interactions between rec sites that they report. So um, we're very excited to, um, about this um, and being able to apply this 
to mutants to try and understand how um, the genome is organized. We've done some replicates now. And we can see the replicate. If we now look at a linear plate, uh, we can look at these are all interactions between 500 base pair bins and the, they look very similar. We have 77,000 interactions that we can call. Um, 83% of the interaction ends overlap a CHIP-seq transcription factor binding site, so, um, and these are usually enhanced, so they're enhancers and promoters, so we think these are, um, these are identifying enhancer and promoter interactions. 64% of them overlap a transcription initiation site, and here the median interaction distance is 10 kilobases. So now we're just starting to look at how these interactions relate to our domains and we haven't done any quantitative analysis of this yet, but we can see that there is an enrichment for um, interactions to stay within domains. So 80% of the interactions um, that are stay either within active domains or within inactive domains. And you can see these nice examples where this active domain has these very high interactions across skipping this inactive domain here um, and this within here. But we also, and here a lot of interactions that are in black here stay within the inactive region, but in blue are interactions that span, that go from active to inactive. And so we definitely see interactions like that too. And we now need to spend more time, um, it, we're, we're uh, busy analyzing these data, so I can't tell you more about this yet. Um, but we're um, now gearing up to, to, because we have access to so many chromatin mutants to then do a whole, and because this procedure is very quick to generate these high C maps in a lot of different chromatin mutants, and then, then we can ask which um, factors are required for particular types of interactions between promoters or enhancers or for generating particular kinds of domains. So just to summarize, um, in the beginning I told you about mapping transcription initiation sites and that we found that a, a large fraction of non-coding transcription occurs at enhancers, that enhancers and promoters have sim are functionally similar and that they both initiate uh, transcription, bidirectional transcription, and that enhancers can function as protein coding promoters. And then that the genome is organized into relatively stable domains of inactive, um, inactive domains it, uh, marked by H3K27 trimethylation containing regulated genes and domains of um, relatively active um, transcription that contain broadly in germline expressed genes marked by H3K36 trimethylation and that domain definition involves some germline events because MES4, this germline histone methyltransferase, um, regulates these domains. And that the borders also separating the domains have large transcription regulatory regions, so there may be a role for transcription in helping to separate these domains. So um, to tell you who did the work, uh, the transcription initiation work that, was, uh, that I told you about at the beginning was mainly done by Ron Chen, and it was a collaboration with Thomas Down. Um, the enhancer promoter functions was done by uh, Chiara, Ron, um, Ron is Chen as well, Carson and Ava. Um, the chromatin domain work was mainly done by Ni Huang um, and Kenneth Evans and Mike Chesney and Shemek Stempor also helped. Um, then um, the mapping the regulatory elements, Alex, uh, Jan and Jurgen contributed to that. And finally, this new, um, doing this new high C method has been done just by, by Ni Huang and um, student Wei Kang. So, and I'm um, happy to take any questions. I think Melissa was first. <laughs> um, so I was just, I'm ready to this, but in the next quarter of the AI, I, and I don't know enough about the feed, but can you follow it out and do you see a resetting of this in, in the progeny or do you have to go? Yeah, so currently we only have data from one time point. So this is data that was generated by Susan Strom's lab and they've just did early embryos. 
So that's something that we'd like to do to see when the zygotic, when we get um, met later in embryogenesis, met one becomes more active and that we can see if that, if we get some um, change. And we really want to do that as alongside the, um, the PRC2 components. They're all essential, so it's very hard to get these large quantities. So they did this by RNAi and we are trying to, um, there is a TS mutant in one of the P PRC to in MESS3 that we're seeing if that if that has a strong enough effect. Or there's a new auxin deg degron system where you can um, try and then um, tag it with the AID and then uh, and maybe in large scale we can have a, 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 a depletion. We're trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so in NSD proteins, those are dedicated mono and dye methylase and catheters. I know Drosophila mescore is a dedicated mono and dye. Besides the chip K36 trial, what's the evidence in the C. elegans that MES family, NSD2 family proteins mm. can try methylation? I think the. Um on a, um, but based on immunofluorescence, Susan Strom's lab's done. It's all antibody. It's all antibody, basically. The antibodies, both she, my lab and her lab, have spent a lot of time at least trying to validate them using peptides so that they look, where we have antibodies, they're sp at least specific based on peptide binding and also some um, other competition assays. So you don't but think it's being, what you're seeing is actually dye, but it's fine to try to some degree? Your tri, your tri antibody is actually recognizing dye. We don't have any evidence that the tri antibody recognizes dye. So if we do at least pep by peptide arrays, we don't. Ha there's no. We can't detect an in the the, the tri antibody binding to dye. But that isn't proving this, and we haven't done mass spec, which would be a, a good thing yeah. to do. And so actually, probably we should. Yeah. Do that to really be sure of, of which modification no. this is. And then I was wondering about the TAD. So, you know, if we're looking at those in, in animals, we think, oh, CTSCF sites. Do nematodes have something similar mm -hmm. to that that might be marked in these domains, or is it all through this domain? So, worm C. elegans don't, doesn't have CTCF. Um, it does have cohesin, and um, it's, and the CTCF is often uh, has uh, has cohesin at these CTCF sites. Um, we have actually mapped cohesin in uh, in the worm, and we do see it enriched all through the active domains, and particularly enriched at the edges of the active domains. But we don't have any transcription factors that we have found yet that are particularly <coughs> enriched there. But what we're doing, we're doing analyses, bioinformatic analyses now of the border regions to see if we see any motifs very specifically enriched. We've looked at for trans in the transcription factor binding um, set data sets that exist. We haven't found any factor that's really seems to be very highly represented. What we see is most transcription factors are enriched at border regions, and there's no there's some that are a little bit more, a little bit less enriched. But um, we're, we're going to start to we're have a project now to look from the, the sequence point of view. Yeah. I presume you're looking to see whether your high C data shows relationships between certain factors and. You know, the border domains that you describe. And, uh, but beyond that, what I found interesting is that when you see divergent transcription, and this seems to be true in other organisms as well, you see a different profile for things that are transcribing the into the active gene or coding region versus those that are divergently transcribing away, making non-coding. So you more see more diffuse uh, profiles on the antis or the divergent direction. Why would that be? So if we did you, is this something that you observed? In your data, you go back to, to the place that you're defining um, diversion transcription way back. First third of your talk, I'm sorry. That's okay. <coughs> sorry, should have gone a bit further. This. Oh, sorry, this, this one. Yeah. So if you, look at, uh -huh. if you look at the peaks, coding, coding, you see a very sharp peak ah. in the sense direction. That's right. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so if we line them up, so the initiation sites tend to be a bit stronger. So if you take protein coding genes, the initiation sites are stronger in the forward direction than the reverse, although they tend to have one in the reverse but orientation. Don't you argue that if but they are strong, you would have a broader Gaussian distribution on the plus characters? Ah, well, the reason why they look sharper is we're aligning them on the forward strand, and that distance isn't exactly 120 bases. It's on average. If you so that it would look the it would look the same. It would be sharp then on the reverse one and broad on the other one. But what we do see is that the antisense, if you take tandemly transcribed, so genes that aren't where you don't have a protein coding gene on both directions, you just have a gene in one direction, the antisense RNA, we don't see any productive elongation in that direction. So we can see initiation very strong, but in the in the nucleus we don't see any evidence. It must be if, if it's made it's just extremely unstable. We can't detect it. And so what controls elongation here? Is it the P type P type thing? Is one being recruited in one place? Yeah. So we don't really know what why one direction is productively elongated, the other isn't. In other systems people there's evidence that splicing sites can um, promote elongation and transcription termination sites can stop elongation and that you have more in, in termination sites in the reverse direction. We actually don't see an increase in termination sites in the reverse direction but we have seen some, this I think, an increase in pyrimidines um, just in, in a region where it would be um, stopping and we're looking to see if there is a real signal there. In the, um, where you map the transcription start sites, you showed an example of a locus that had a hundred or hundreds of transcription mm -hmm. start sites, and some of those were within introns. Can a transcription start site in an intron turn it into an outron? In other words, do you start to see any uh, SLR, SL2 transposing to those? So that's a bit hard to answer. So modern code from Bob Waterston's modern code group mapped, um, did a lot of RNA, very deep RNA-seq. And if you sequence, if you take all those huge billions of reads, they can detect at low frequency SL1 to almost every exon. So, so it's actually hard to know what the frequency and if that's important or not. But you don't see SL1 uh, uh, splicing sites that correspond to your transcription. No, we do sometimes, and those in those situations, a, an, a smaller transcript has been annotated. So when, so, but generally we do see a lot of um, a lot of um, initiation sites and transcription factor binding sites in introns, and they don't always correspond to promoters. Yeah. Question here, and then we'll move back. Just kind of getting back to the answer. Did you ever look at common? So the first question is really interesting and we haven't done it yet, is trying to put different elements together to see how they might interact and produce different different sorts of patterns or interfere and we're doing that now. Um, what we did in our initial study is we had, um, we just took 500 bases because we were taking, we we're centering on the peak and maybe about a third of our data is from that. But after the initial results and looking more at the at these initiation sites, the, we are now just going from the, be, we're just taking elements um, that have bidirectional transcription initiation and just from initiation site to the initiation site in the region in between, and those are usually, be they're between 120 and say 300 bases, so they're very small. Just these little tiny elements just defined by bidirectional transcription initiation. One last question. I'm not sure if I missed. Transcription match enhancers, transcription match promoters, are they differential uh, with regard to what type of genes say what is more important gene expression points or non important gene expression points? Um. Well, 
by definition, a if it's a protein coding promoter, then it's, it's transcription at a protein coding gene. So the enhancers, we see transcription at enhancers, and that's generally we see doesn't look like it's as we see some productive elongation, it doesn't elongate very far. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Is That's right. Oh, you mean if if you see transcription and enhancer, do we see the it's it's interacting promoter? transcribed we don't because we're just starting to map interactions between the enhancers and promoters we haven't looked at that but what we can say we can see um, the enhancer we can generally see the enhancers associated with the promoter because we see um, elongation across enhancer regions and then if we measure um, transcription at, the, at enhancers and the nearby genes that's co strongly correlated. So we have a strong positive correlation between transcription at upstream enhancers and the protein coding genes downstream. So that, that definitely is very, like 0.7 correlation, it's quite strong. Thank you, Julie. It is, it's this month, I've been 25 years.